Um, I'm going to talk about this tool, Text2 Image Linking Tool. Um, and we've been working on this for on and off for a couple of years. Um, so I'll show you what I've got at the moment. Um, so the first question I'm going to look at is why should you link text to images? Um, it seems um, perhaps a silly thing to do. After all, you can see the image, you can read it, you've got a transcription. Why do you want them together? Um, you can look at that question of why, and then I'm going to look at how the, the program works or how the, the software works and the unfinished parts, the, the GUI mock-ups. I think this is important uh, to show how we would uh, envisage interaction uh, to facilitate user, um, users doing things automatically as far as possible. So um, the main reason is that our libraries are full of thousands of uh, literary and documentary uh, artifacts. Um, by artifacts, I mean not just books, but also manuscripts um, or even just uh, records. Um, records of lawsuits, um, documents from historical archives, etc. Um, and the question is, how can we bring these uh, precious items to a modern audience who expects to use them over the web, <coughs> expects to search them and interact with them somehow? Um, if you put them in a, a repository, uh, which is normally done, you take your images of your pages of newspapers or whatever, and you store them uh, with some metadata, the user can search them very coarsely, uh, and is invited to click on one of these thumbnails and stare at a very dull looking image. Um, and the other question is, um, if you have, for example, a manuscript, um, you know, is, is the page image on its own when you've got it, is it of really much use? Because it, you know, the text may be very hard to read, as in this case. There may be alterations, uh, as here. Uh, there may even be sections of vertical text. Um, there may be gaps, stains. Uh, there's a different line break and a different um, lineation. Uh, between the manuscript and the transcription that you're going to try and read. So linking the two together seems to make sense. Uh, here's one attempt. This is the uh, massive uh, attempt by Google, um, who originally used Adobe software. They don't seem to use it anymore. Um, they've got like three million uh, historical books which have been digitized, uh, and they've got text related to this, uh, these images. So if you select a, a range of uh, a page image, it'll tell you what the transcription is for that particular section. Now this seems to be good uh, on a, a large scale, you can automate it, uh, but it is limited. It only works with OCR uh, compatible texts. If it has any errors, it's quite hard to fix um, these um, pieces of text here. It's usually read only and you can't format, reformat the text in a readable format and allowing it to be annotated. Uh, another um, approach uh, which uh, humanists seem to like is to format uh, to, to have the text next to uh, the page image. You've got your page image, you've got your transcription. Sorry, it's not very clear. Um, basically, this allows you to annotate the text separately. Uh, you can verify it and even edit it. Um, but the problem then becomes one of uh, user usability. Um, how do you keep the image and the text in sync? If you've reformatted the text, you've got different lineation. You spend most of your time scanning the image to say, oh, where is that word? Is that the correct word? Do I need to change it? Uh, and as you scroll down, you need to scroll the, the page image and keep it in sync with the, the line with spacing on the right. Um, so at what level do we, do we link the text and the image? We could just link it at page level. That would be quite easy. Uh, usually when we have transcriptions, we have um, pages marked. Uh, but it's rather coarse, and it doesn't reduce the, the mental effort required to uh, see where uh, the words are in the image. Or we could link it at the line level. Um, this limits the way that we can uh, create the interface. We have to take the lineation of the original uh, document. We can't reflow, which would be necessary for these modern devices, mobile phones, smartphones, or iPads. Um, but the word level seems to work best. Uh, this is where we take um, simple words, and we link them one for one. Even if they're split over a line, we can have a, a split image, uh, one half the image at one end, line end, and the other at the other. Um, so approach, this is approach has been followed by other people, and generally what they do is they have a kind of manual approach to the problem. You draw a line around the, um, or a box or a circle or something around the word, and you link it manually to the word in the text. Now, this takes an enormous amount of time. If anyone's ever done a couple of pages of this, you go quite mad. Uh, it has even been suggested that you could use crowdsourcing, uh, and you could get people to do this uh, online. I think you'd go nuts after half a page, myself. Um, oh, and the other problem is the markup gets very complicated. You have this shape to describe. You have to say whereabouts in the text. Uh, it is, and vice versa. The text has to point to the shape. So uh, the, the level of technology required that an disaster of the user is quite high. Um, we also need uh, separate transcriptions, usually for formatting the links and the text, because the text has to be formatted, has to be displayed, 
That's one uh, level of markup. Another level of markup which is imposed on top of it is to produce these links. So what's usually done is you have two transcriptions of the text, which is uh, generally impractical. Um, now just to uh, uh, emphasize the fact this is not an entirely original idea. Um, uh, people at the University of Kentucky tried with the E. Beowulf edition to create a manual text to image link editor uh, from about 2000 onwards. Uh, quite successful, they developed this cool tool called EPT. Uh, the Tile Project text to image link editor, which is obviously very close to my acronym, um, was funded by the Mellon Foundation and that project ended 2011. That was again mostly a manual uh, technique. Uh, and also the German text grid project has a text to image link editor, again a manual process. So the differences uh, between Tilt and these other ones is basically two. One is that I try to automate the process of finding these links. Um, so the idea is to find words in an image, unlike the transcriptorium project, without recognizing their content. All we're looking for is to just say, oh, that's a word, and it's this word. That's the entire extent of the automation. And what this relies on is the existence of a transcription of a page content already. Now, you might think this is you know, not very likely, but in fact, in most cases that we look at, at least in digital humanities, we've already got a transcription, maybe a rough one, maybe we've got a transcription of a different version, a printed text as opposed to a manuscript. So very often we've got a reasonable transcription. Uh, and the idea is just to link these two components in a mostly or entirely automatic fashion. So this is the, the program. This is version two of Tilt. Um, version one was all in one. So this is dividing the, the typical um, page recognition um, process. It's got a pointer. No. Go. Yeah, the page um, recognition service up here. This is a Java uh, service designed for um, high speed and using a, an image processing library. And the GUI, which at the bottom is mostly incomplete at the moment, which is the user interaction part where you try to refine the, um, the recognition process when it doesn't work or just to supervise it in some way. So the, the web uh, interface sends the image back to the service. The server then responds with its recognized uh, shapes and links um, and you also send up the text to be linked to it. And the text can be in either plain text or HTML. Uh, here's an example of how we store it. Again, this is another big difference from the other approaches. We don't use embedded markup to record um, the links. We use simple overlay. This is using a, a geographical um, uh, country description format, which exists already, GeoJSON. Uh, this is just allows you to describe polygon shapes, uh, which correspond to the words on this particular page and uh, they're annotated with the pointers to the text over there. So there's no alteration to the image or the text. Once you've got this overlay, you can just display it together. Um, some of the uh, preparation uh, for recognition on very complex cases like this, you probably have to segment the text. We're not pretending that we can automatically recognize manuscripts which have blocks of text, vertical, horizontal, or whatever, and all sorts of things. We want to recognize it in a certain sequence. So you could, if you know, although you might think, oh, this is manual, you know, but you're manually a uh, editing whole blocks at once. So it does make it a lot easier. This is just specifying an order of one, two, three, four, five, how the, the text should be recognized as it will be in the transcription. So the process is a, basically a simple OCR technique. You start with your color image of your page. You reduce it to grayscale. And from grayscale to black and white, that's not as simple as it seems. Very often you have uh, pages which have got uneven illumination. If you just reduce it to black and white, you'll get a complete mess. So this uses a local uh, bypass filter to go over the image in tiny little areas. Seems to work fairly well. Uh, then you have to find the word shape. Oh, have I left that? No. Then you have to find the lines. This, uh, our technique is basically looking for lines based on the density in the, of the pixels in columns. So if the text is tilted or curved, it can still recognize the line successfully. Um, and finally, to recognize the word shapes that it has found on the lines. This is the hardest bit and the bit that doesn't really work so well on uh, manuscripts yet. Um, here's an example of some of the problems you face. Here's a, a typical manuscript where you haven't actually got really nice straight lines. You've got curved lines. And if you sort of decide to divide it horizontally, you'll get this all wrong. Another problem, which you can see here, is that dense descenders and ascenders produce these extra lines. The line recognition algorithm can't really decide which line that descenders on, so it puts another line in between. However, there's a reduction step to get rid of these ones. Um, here's another problem. Recognizing words in printed text is generally fairly easy. Let's say we've got 
300 words in your transcription, then it stands to reason that the 299 biggest gaps, including line endings, are going to be into word gaps, and all the others are just going to be into letter spaces. So unfortunately, this doesn't work in manuscripts very well, because you've got cases like this, where you have two words very close together, which is taken as being one word. And down here, you've got one word, which has got a big gap in it, which it's assumed uh, is two letters, two, two um, words, sorry. Um, so the question is, how do we outline these words once we've recognized them? Um, basically, words are defined as being blobs of connected <coughs> pixels that are close together. Um, you could use circles. People have suggested that. Um, I haven't found very many circular words around. Uh, rectangles, um, this is commonly used, uh, but it doesn't really work if you have slanted or curved <coughs> text. Um, so we've just gone for simple polygons. They're a bit harder to draw, but you can enclose anything, obviously. Um, our polygons are just convex hulls. They're pretty crude and pretty ugly. And we'd like to have a more sexier kind of polygon when we get it working better so that you get a slight standoff around the word. Um, so how do we link the word shapes uh, that we recognize in the image to the words in the text? This is the bit of tilt that works very well. It uses an alignment technique, um, basically similar to uh, alignment techniques in bio biographical, oh, bi biological applications. Uh, and what it does is it looks for once you've got your word shapes, you know how wide the words are in the image, and you know how wide the words are in the text. So all you do is align these widths. And this works even when you mis make mistakes, as I'll try and show you here. So if you've got avowed here and avowed here, you started at the beginning, and this width is about the same. Same for the second word, not, only, and so on. Ah, here you've got two words running together. Common mistake. Um, but you know that the width of that shape is much bigger than the of. So you, you know the sequence of widths. So you can assign those two words to that. And what it's trying to do is to minimize the leftover stuff. You know, it's, it's just trying to assign things. It doesn't actually work left to right. I'm doing this just for illustration. It does it takes a global view of a whole text on the page, and it aligns it as well as it can. So you get the other problem here. It's split the, the word into two halves because of a slight um, gap there. And it, again, it can assign two words. So it works bi-directionally, either mistakes here or, mis or now, either splits or, or merges will be um, assigned. Uh, here we've got uh, four words run together, a very big error, but there's no problem aligning those four. Once you've aligned these four words with that, you've got in a position to sort of look at that closer, and it tries to split it up into four separate words. So it's similar goes on now. The reason I'm coloring it differently is because different lines uh, need to be distinguished in some way, because you've got them running together here. OK, here's another uh, automation. This is really looking at the, how we can take the algorithm further. Um, here's a Tibetan text, which um, is pretty hard. And I don't think the, the algorithm, when we tried this, it did not recognize this, couldn't discover any words. Um, but what you could do is use the word recognition uh, tool. You just click on it, and it tries to recognize some text uh, around that. So if you <coughs> recognize this word, you can then link it together. Now, this may seem tedious, but it's a hell of a lot easier than drawing shapes around words. I'm not sure whether these are words, by the way. I don't know any Tibetan. Um, but yeah, that's a partial automation, which will allow you to get through a page relatively quickly. Uh, here's another uh, automation which we haven't implemented, but I think it's quite important. Um, what happens in this case, where you have uh, insertions into the text and deletions, the algorithm has a problem aligning uh, the words correctly. So it starts off OK. But if you look at a word here, it's got completely the wrong word down there. And the way we get around this, so here's another mistake, is we align manually one word at the beginning of a clean section, which doesn't have any alteration, and one word at the end. So we link that up. And then these are treated as anchors. And the text in between is then reassigned using the alignment algorithm so that the word spacing, the words are now correctly assigned. Sorry. So you can see at the end it's now correct and all the ones in between. Uh, if everything else fails, you've also got the standard fallback of just being able to draw a polygon uh, around the word and manually link it. This is tedious, but in cases where you can't do anything else, uh, that's what you're going to have to do. Now I'm going to show, if I am, can a few demonstrations. Uh, this is a, just to give you an example of a TypeScript. Um, this is going through the press. This is just a test interface. As I say, we haven't got a GUI. We just have this back end, which we can test from. So gradual reduction. Oh, by the way, this is the masking, which would be part of the, the GUI front end. Um, your reduction to two-tone, the cleaning, which is just getting rid of dirt. Um, sometimes we blur it because it, it joins up the broken words. 
the baseline recognition uh, in this case, because the lines are very close together, hasn't worked brilliantly, but we have a reduction algorithm which improves the situation. Then the word recognition, which looks along the lines to see where the words are. The reason they're in colors is so that I can see which line the word was recognized on top of. Uh, and then we can do the linking. And you can see that even in this fairly difficult case, moderately difficult case, you've got you know, 80, 90% or so correctly recognized, even in the, the handwritten stuff at the bottom, November. I'm going to do another example quickly. This is an example where it works very well. And I'll show you one where it doesn't work as well. Um, I guess this isn't very challenging because this is a standard OCR kind of problem. Uh, so cleaning just gets rid of that dirt in the margin. This is automatic, so I didn't prepare the image at all. Uh, again, we didn't blur it. The baselines are pretty good, even reduced slightly better. Recognition of words is good. Uh, linking produces about 95% correct. Again, there's no preparation of this, this text here. Every word is more or less spot on. Uh, we could tidy up a bit. I'll show you one where it doesn't work very well at all. Well, it works moderately badly. I could also show you some ones where it doesn't work at all. So. <laughs> but I think they'd be rather uninteresting. Uh, I'm not claiming it's perfect. Uh, this is a manuscript, again, with some changes. Cleaning. Uh, I'll jump ahead a bit. Baseline recognition. It tries to recognize things like this, which are inserted there, but it's a bit difficult. Uh, but we can reduce that. Word recognition, again, using the idea of spaces between the biggest spaces are the word spaces. Um, if you look at the linking, it's probably only about 80% <coughs> right. Um, we got that, yeah, that's basically right. This doesn't rely on line breaks, by the way. It's just aligning the whole text against the whole text, because you mightn't have the line breaks. Uh, I think that's all I want to show. Thank you.